Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another In the Pit with Lobo Tigre. Or in this case, since I'm not grilling a, a, a mining stock CEO, maybe just an independent view with my friend Rick Rule of Sprott. So Rick, our mutual audiences have heard us both talking a lot about what's going on in the markets, but I think we have to give them our latest take on all the shenanigans going on. The crash of 2020. Is it over? If so, why? And if not, why not? I think that depends on how you define the crash, Lobo. If you're uh, referring to a crash that involves all asset classes, uh, I suspect that you're going to see a continued rally in financial assets, really as a consequence of the fact that investors want to believe that the big thinkers in the world are going to save them from themselves, and also because of the incredible amount of liquidity being injected into the system. I watched, as an example, uh, the Fed walk into the junk bond market, the junk bond ETFs, a couple of weeks ago. And it was a truly amazing display of power. Uh, if you have what is at least temporarily an unlimited checkbook, you can inflate any market that you want to. And watching them waltz, if that's the right phrase, from asset class to asset class, being the buyer of last resort, to be sure, but a big buyer. Uh, is a very interesting circumstance. And I think that this can go on uh, as long as confidence can be maintained. Uh, I think there's a couple classes of intelligent speculators out there. There is one class of momentum-oriented, liquid-oriented, short-term traders who populate the deaths of, the deaths of big hedge funds. Uh, and they say, don't fight the Fed, don't fight the tape. But they are prepared to lose billion-dollar positions in five minutes. By lose, I mean sell, uh, <laughs> when the momentum goes against them. And there are other people who have said, um, this is a precept that's unsustainable, uh, and I'm going to step aside. Most people who are participating in the market look, they don't think. And the fact that markets go up is all the confirmation that they need. <laughs> My suspicion is that those people are going to be hurt. So let's, that was a very erudite answer, but if we could take this down to earth a little bit for the average person out there, there seems to be this huge disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. And yes, I get the big money bazookas. The Fed came out with just, as you say, an, an awesome display of financial power and its ability to interfere or help. I guess those are the same thing when it comes to the government. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, still the reality is, is the ongoing train wreck in the economy and a little bit of opening up is, is not going to make people go to the movie theaters and all these other things that we don't need to get in the details, but this, this disconnect. So you touched on something, you know, it, there's, there's liquidity and there's solvency and all the liquidity in the world is not going to make these companies solvent if the customers aren't there. So you know, how long can this go on? You, you put it much better than I, Lobo. Uh, and the most honest answer is I don't know. Uh, since you've asked me, I'll try to talk around it. What you say is very true. Uh, and I think you left some things unsaid, which need to be said. The first is that before the sort of COVID induced crash, if that's what you think induced the crash, which I do, uh, we had 10 years of economic recovery and that economic recovery, I would suggest was driven more by fiscal measures, more by quantitative easing and artificially low interest rates by the injection of false liquidity that it was an increase in productivity or opening up of markets around the world. So I would have said, had this circumstance not occurred and we were being interviewed today, <laughs> that we needed an unwinding, that we needed a long, slow grinding recession, a long, slow grinding bear market. Um, COVID from my point of view was, if you will, the pin into a series of balloons. And rather than having a grinding, boring, long, price discovery process, <laughs> we forward shifted it. Now, I don't think that investors have bothered to think through the consequences uh, of both an unwinding of a long recovery uh, and also the decline in economic activity that we have seen. The decline in economic activity that we've seen around the world and in the US is, at least in my lifetime, unprecedented. A drop, as an example, in oil demand by 20 <laughs> percent to the extent that we don't actually have a place to put the stuff that we produce. And as you suggest, coming back from this is going to be a challenge. How do you refloat as many industries as have to be refloated? What do you do with workers 
uh, as an example in the restaurant and hospitality or the events industry that may stay uh, impacted, if that's the correct phrase, for two to three years. Right. Uh, what do you do with commercial real estate when organizations like Sprott come to the conclusion that symbolic workers, knowledge workers, can work at home almost efficiently as they can work in office space? So you find many people like us figuring out that they can reduce their real estate occupancy by 50%. Wonderful for us, harsh for landlords. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot that needs to wash through this circumstance. And then the other thing that I don't think has been looked at is the impact on credit markets that will come from a reduction in economic activity and a reduction in the ability of all levels of issuers, federal, state, local governments, companies, individual credit cards, to service those debts. How many leaky ships yes. can the Fed keep afloat and for how long? I'm delighted, frankly, that that's Mr. Trump's problem and not Mr. <laughs> Rule's problem. Well, it, spoken as a credit analyst, that's, that's the Rick Rule answer I was looking for. I, I refer to you uh, fondly as, a, as my friend, the loan shark, and that's mm -hmm. what you do. You're, you're a credit analyst. So that's exactly the insight I'm looking for here, and, and I'm glad to hear you say that because I just don't think these guys have, I don't want to just say they're clueless. I, I think they're relying on models that no longer hold true. How, how can anyone forecast anything when we really don't even know yet what the medical unknowns will prove out to be? Um, and, and yet we have to, right? Unless we're going to step out of the markets entirely and just go home and sit on, on literally cash. Um, if we're going to be speculators in the market. So, so how do you, Rick Rule, the loan shark, how do you function in this environment where really nobody knows anything? Lobo, one of my faults when I was young, and a fault that's common among many investors, is they want certainty, even if the certainty is false. <laughs> the simple declarative statement in copy and politics sells, uh, but the simple declarative statement is almost always wrong. I've learned to exist in a world of probabilities. Uh, and I think if you exist in a world of probabilities, uh, that you find a way through this difficulty because you're competing against people who are addicted to false certainty. <laughs> Let's look at some probabilities. One probability is that the policy response to the circumstance that we find ourselves in is a double dose of the disease. Uh, I don't mean COVID by way right. of the disease. I, I mean that the cure for a liquidity squeeze is more liquidity, more quantitative easing, more counterfeiting. The uh, cure for uh, excessive debt and deficits is more debt uh, and deficits. The cure for artificially low interest rates is artificially low interest rates, according to the big thinkers. What are the probable outcomes of that? Well, in our business, the most easy prof, uh, probable outcome is that the wind is in the sails of gold. Uh, traditionally, an asset class that does well when people's perceptions of the protection of their purchasing power in fiat currencies and sovereign debt gets challenged. And how could that faith not be challenged? In the first instance, you debase the currency with quantitative easing, counterfeiting. In the second instance, the credit quality gets obliterated because the income statement of the issuer, I'm being a credit analyst right now, the income statement of the issuer, the ability that they have to pay me my interest rate is compromised by $2 trillion a year in deficits <laughs> at the same time that the debt, including the on balance sheet liabilities, the net present value of on balance sheet liabilities grows by $4 trillion a year. That's in addition to quantitative easing. And where the coupon that they pay me to protect my purchasing power and to compensate me for the risk I take is negative. So let's look at the probabilities. How attractive is return-free risk? Uh, I would suggest to you that gold's primary uh, opponent uh, in the financial world is sovereign instruments, which is to say the US 10-year treasury. And I would suggest that right now, the headwind that gold faces is return-free risk. Is it certain that gold will go up? No. Is there a probability that gold will go up? Yes. So let's start with that probability. Okay. Let, let me jump you, in and, and 
Please. You return free risk, and we're talking about coupon here. We're talking about competing with negative interest rates. And I, the succinct way in this, uh, in my mind, to put this is simply, this answers that long and tiresome question of gold doesn't pay interest. Well, you know what? Not paying interest looks pretty good to me right now compared to negative interest. Jim Grant calls it a good honest zero. <laughs> uh, let's, let, let's look just for fun at the U.S. 10-year Treasury. Okay. They pay you 60 basis points right now. Six-tenths of 1%, I think, is the number. The Congressional Budget Office, not some fat old libertarian crank named Rick Rule, suggests that the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar is declining by 1.6% compounded. I think it's more than that, but let's use their number for fun. What they're doing is actually telling you the truth for the first time in recorded history. They promise to give you back less than you gave them if you give them money for 10 years. That's the value proposition. You're upside down 1% a year for 10 years. This is what gold's facing. Um, I wish I faced challenges like that more consistently. And to put this into a, a different way of putting the context, it's interesting to me, think about what has gold done over the last 10 years. We're in 2020, so 2010, gold was already on a rise, but I don't have the number you know, day to day from 10 years ago exactly, but we must be up about 50% over the last 10 years, given that we were still ramping up into that 1900 peak in 2011. Right. So, you know, a 10 year treasury versus gold over the last 10 years, gold would have beat it hands down. And frankly, I'd much rather be forward thinking, unfortunately. I, I, I mean, I realize the importance of history, but I'm also cognizant uh, of letting history determine my future course too much because I often feel like drawing lessons, too many lessons from history involves polishing the hell out of the rearview mirror in my car when I'm going forward. The truth is that the fiscal tools that we used to survive the difficulty that we had in 2008 have been overused. Uh, you get less economic growth with increasing amounts of liquidity uh, and uh, increasing subsidization of the interest rate. If you get your economic growth through false liquidity, what you really do is steal demand from forward periods. And we've been stealing demand from forward periods so long that one must ask oneself uh, how much further we can push this thing. From my own point of view, at age 67, I hope we can push it for a very long time <laughs> because I'd prefer not to live through those interesting times that Doug Casey describes. But I wonder arithmetically whether that wish will come true. Understood. Okay, so we're in too much agreement here. Uh, so let me push back a little bit. Uh, deflation. There's so much demand destruction. There's clearly people, you know, if they're staying home, they're staying home. They're not spending. And we just saw the U.S. savings rate spike to the highest level in like more than a decade, which is good. Yeah, I'm not complaining. It's, it's wonderful to see people saying, oh, maybe, maybe we should save a little, not live from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, but that is a deflationary uh, force. It, it would be reductive of the velocity of money. And there are other things that are deflationary. I'm not making a big deflation argument, at least not longer term. But in the immediate term, it seems like the immediate effect of, you know, stopping the economy, it, it's easy to see that there could be deflation in the near term. And would that not potentially not go down a, a bit for a while? Lobo, that's a great, great Great point. The 900 pound gorilla in the room is if the government loses control of faith, uh, if artificially low interest rates and artificial liquidity aren't sufficient to prop up the, the credit cycle, then we have a default cycle. And while I don't believe that that's probable, I certainly believe it's possible. I, I said earlier that I believe that US dollar-based savings subject you to a diminution of purchasing power. That having been said, well over 20% of my own personal portfolio is in US cash. The cash gives me the liquidity, uh, that is the tools and the courage to take advantage of volatility rather than being taken advantage of. And the specter of uh, deflation and default is something that we have to consider. I think actually it would be helpful, Lobo. I mean, we talked about the off balance sheet liabilities of the US government being in excess of $120 trillion. What that is in many senses is a generational transfer of wealth from younger people to older people. 
And it would amuse me, frankly, uh, if your generation and younger generation said to my generation, you guys voted yourself all these benefits, you pay for them. We're not going to. Uh, your viewers and listeners will hate this, but repudiating the Social Security liability, repudiating the medical care, the Medicare liability, uh, repudiating the incurred but unfunded liability in the Environmental Defense Fund. The truth is that there are $120 billion in off-balance sheet net present value entitlements that you could default on. It would be politically <laughs> extremely unpopular. Sorry, $120 billion? Trillion. I was going to say, that's just a month T. of QE right now. T. <laughs> T. Yes, I... I I get that. And, and it might come to a point as younger voters get in there where it, it's sort of the world of Logan's Run, if you remember the reference. Uh, you know, not eat the rich, but eat the old, as it were. Uh, Soylent Green. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so I, I know that you're very adroit at avoiding um, being put in that prediction box. It's something you and I share. We, we don't like to make bold predictions that can be so easily wrong. So let me just say, would you be willing to put a price range or do you have a sense for, as these things unfold, the probability you and I have discussed, you know, where might gold be over the next year or two? Is Bank of America with their $3,000 gold uh, prediction, is that conservative or is it too high? Are you willing to go there? How about if we do this, Lobo? Uh, I won't give you a gold price. Uh, Buffett says predictions tell you a lot about the predictor and very little about the future. Uh, if you review the Barron's Gold Mining Index chart that we've talked about from time to time, and you look at the performance of gold equities, uh, which normally begins six to nine months after the gold price moves, um, I would be surprised if the big gold equities index, the XAU, two years from now wasn't up by 100 percent. When we look at past uh, gold equities bull markets, there have been eight, oversold, eight, eight recoveries from oversold bottoms in my professional career. The most tepid response for the index, not the best stock in the index, right. the most tepid response for the index was something like 180% to the upside, uh, and the largest response was 1,200% to the upside. I would suggest that as a consequence of where we are in the precious metal cycle, that we are just off the bottom uh, in a pretty good run for the gold equities. The only caveat to that would be a real broad stock market decline. If we don't see a catastrophic stock market decline, well, I can't make a gold price prediction. My, I, I would be surprised if two years from now the gold equities indexes weren't double where they are today. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'll let you go on that one. That's not a weasel. That's actually a useful answer. Um, but it, That's very aggressive for me. <laughs> it, it reminds me of something else that I've heard you say, and recently, and that is this pattern of the money flowing first to the majors. Um, and while that's true, my experience has been that it's, it's not true of the quality juniors. And, and my experience is not as long as yours, but I remember very vividly at the very bottom in 2008, late November and then December, when nobody was quite sure, you know, that things were really good, you know, that was it, right? Um, it, some of the best juniors that had a real discovery in hand, you know, they rebounded immediately. They didn't wait for any kind of confirmation from trickle down from the majors or whatever. So I, I'm wondering, do you still see that relationship? Is that true or would, would excitement, yeah. you know? Lobo, I think, I think your qualification, which is to say the best, the best juniors, means that in your case, you're using the exception to prove the rule. Um, the best juniors is a subset of 20 stocks in an 1800 <laughs> stock universe. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll give and you that I one. Let me, let me jump back I would back suggest that best junior is almost an oxymoron, but keep going. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that one. Okay, let me put it this way then. Could the majors not face uh, specific to the circumstances today headwinds? You've got COVID shutdowns, and if we open up again, then you've got social distancing, which is really hard to do in a skip. You can put one miner down at a time. You know, what, what does that do to your, your operating? Okay, we've got a, a tailwind from lower energy prices. We've got a headwind from all these COVID rules and restrictions and things. And, and who knows if there's a second wave or something like that. Isn't there an operational risk in the majors that is not present in a junior that 
you know, they, they can social distance on moose pasture. I, I would suggest to you that the median, well, first of all, that the median junior is valueless. <laughs> that if you're talking about the junior market as a whole, you're talking about a universe of 1,500 to 2,000 stocks, 80% of which have no value whatsoever. So the probability of a valueless company exceeding is arithmetically uh, insignificant. Uh, I would suggest uh, four things for the majors. The first is that this is partially self-serving. Uh, at Sprott, we service 22, two, pardon me, 220,000 investors worldwide. And we would prefer that the less knowledgeable of them concentrated in the bigger stocks because we see them as less risky alternatives. Understood. We see, too, a circumstance where the sins of the sector were so egregious over the last 20 years <laughs> and so many management teams were allowed to pursue other employment opportunities that the management teams in place, at least for the next 18 to 24 months, I think will be less inclined to make mistakes than they made in the two decades that preceded this. And we're talking about the management at the majors, right? Majors, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I was wondering about that. Uh, no guarantee that that's true. Remember, we're talking about probabilities here. <laughs> the third thing I would say is that when your product price goes up and your input costs, if you're an Australian or Canadian producer, go down in your domestic currency, at the same time that you get a subsidy from low energy prices, the impact on margins has been understated. Uh, finally, I would say that the expectation for success that the gold industry enjoys in the face of broad industry observers still couldn't be worse. Uh, and stocks <laughs> go up because they exceed expectations. Uh, there are no expectations of this industry. The beauty of the larger ones is that gold industry investors have still been their memories of the punishment that they endured over the last 10 years are still very strong. And despite the fact that they're a risk-taking bunch inherently, they are inclined to take less risk because they're tired of being spanked. Uh, and so <laughs> the first movers will, as a consequence, be in the bigger stocks. As generalists come into the sector, uh, the generalist institutional investor, understanding for at least a little while their lack of knowledge, will also come into the biggest, least riskiest, and most liquid stocks. Okay. Now, when the valuation disparities get larger, and by the way, they're large now, when the valuation dispar disparities between the largest and most liquid companies and other companies get too great, two things will happen. Uh, gold industry investors will go down market in search of value. At the same time, the uh, persistent discrepancies in share price and cost of capital will cause the M&A cycle to keep going, which is to say that the market will eliminate the discount itself, which I think is a great, great, great investment theme. But the truth is that markets have followed fairly predictable patterns in the last eight, in the last eight cycles. This cycle may be compressed, but my suspicion is that the reason that the cycle exists is all rational and again, probabilistic. Okay, excellent points. One more thing on this before we move on, because I want to talk about other commodities as well. I've been getting a bunch of emails from readers who are concerned about the, uh, the Fed swap lines with some countries maybe having a disproportionate impact on, I mean, I, I won't get into the whole thing. I think you and I both know the source of this, yeah. but it's basically political risk. And, and does the current situation in this, do you see the swap line thing as a real impact in making a difference in political risk, which has always been there? And would you, you know, in uh, the majors, Specifically, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because a lot of the majors, you know, they're multiple jurisdictions. They're big companies with a lot of mines, and they can't pick and choose, you know, where, where the Fred is going to share a swap line. You know, it was a fascinating argument. You and I are both very fond of the guy who made the argument. Um, and I think that the existence of swap lines lowers the cost of capital uh, and hence the capital risk in certain jurisdictions. There was a, a, a different thing put forward, I think, yesterday by S&P Market Watch that talked about the frequency of gold discoveries around the world. Uh, and there was an amazing correlation between uh, lack of discovery and the existence of swap lines. <laughs> that is, the major gold discoveries that have taken place in th places like the United States and Canada, which are perceived to be of low political risk, means that you have higher technical risk in places that have low political risk. And from my own point of view, while political risk has always bothered me, 
I have done better during t- during periods of time when I've participated in the discovery of something to steal. Uh, <laughs> that is where I've taken political risk over technical risk than periods of time when I have done the other thing. I, I think that Marin's concerns are well placed, and I would suspect that they are ninth or tenth on the list of my concerns. I'm delighted that he brought it up because it caused a whole subject to enter my psyche that hadn't been there until he'd done it for me. Okay, fair enough. All right, so gold, we've talked about gold. Is it fair to lump silver in there? Or again, given the economic realities we're looking at and that there is, you know, in addition to its investment demand, a very real industrial side to silver, um, are you as bullish on silver or think it's going to perform just for a while or down for the count? Any comments silver on silver? Silver traditionally has been later cycle, mm-hmm. which is to say that gold moves first. Gold moves based on fear. Uh, silver is the poor man's gold. When in prior markets, the momentum is established by gold, silver moves later and it moves further. The most volatile of all asset classes that I'm familiar with, however, with the possible exception of small uranium stocks, <laughs> are silver stocks. Uh, Doug Casey taught me 30 years ago that the population of high quality silver names is so small that when the pool of investment I- I- investor capital moves into that sector, that the combined market cap isn't large enough to contain the inflows and that market caps absolutely swell. And I think that will be very much the case now. I think that the that the silver price will be delayed relative to the gold price. And I think, as you say, that industrial demand for silver is going to be hit much more than many people believe. But I believe it is an investment metal uh, as well as an industrial material. And I believe, again, I hate to keep using this word, but I want to keep using the word. I think the probability is that it will be a later cycle move. And I suspect that for intelligent speculators who can handle volatility, that the most money that will be made in the equities in the sector will still be made on the higher quality silver stocks. Okay. To give people some practical guidance on that right now, is this something that you just don't bother timing or do you maybe wait six months or or you just say, look, this is cheap I'm buying now and I'm not going to worry about what happens in the interim? Um, I err towards the latter. Uh, My timing track record is almost unblemished by success over 35 years. And so I like to enter high quality names uh, fairly early in the cycle. I'm also a pathological cheapskate. So if something is up 30% off the bottom, I'm disinclined to buy it. I normally have to buy it on the way in or I won't buy it. But I've experienced in my own lifetime uh, remarkable good fortune with concentrated investments in silver companies run by high quality people. And the opportunity to do that exists today. uh, And so I'm doing it. My suspicion is that what I'm doing constitutes dead money for the next, you know, nine to 12 months. Although I must say that the share price moves we've seen in names like Mag uh, and Silvercrest maybe belies that statement. I'm not expecting any immediate gratification, but I certainly welcome it when it occurs. Sure. Um, On this, um, one other thing that a lot of readers have asked about is the discrepancy between the uh, retail bullion market and the prices uh, on the COMEX. Um, Do you think that those high premiums matter at all? Is there a way for that physical demand to trickle up, as it were, to the traders? Or I don't think so. I, I think uh, what you're seeing is a unique set of circumstances. You're seeing incredible uh, increase in retail participation in gold and silver markets at the same time that the physical products available to buy in retail quantities aren't available. Uh, Sprott has recently been buying between 20 and $50 million in metal a day to uh, accept increased demand for our physical products. And in institutional product size, which is to say 400 ounce gold bars and large silver, uh, I wouldn't try to say that we haven't had a little bit of difficulty in sourcing metal, but we've been able to source metal uh, still. There can be imbalances in institutional supply. In other words, there can be supply at the LBMA 
when the materials needed in Chicago right. <laughs> or in Toronto. But you can solve that problem. Uh, what's happened with regards to uh, the retail product is that the uh, inventory experienced a surge in demand at the same time that particularly the Swiss refiners who produce it and the Royal Canadian Mint shut down as a consequence of COVID. So you had no supply and increased demand. And that's what drove premiums. Uh, the Royal Canadian Mint has reopened, at least for the fabrication of some products. And we understand that the uh, Swiss refiners and mints are reopening too. So we would suspect that an increasing amount of 400 ounce product gets uh, recast as 50 and 100 gram product and that that uh, shortage and therefore the premiums will uh, be alleviated over the sort of four to six week time frame. If really, people are quickly. experiencing a difficulty with regards to obtaining physical product and the premiums, they can of, of course always employ the finest substitute, which is to say the Sprott exchange traded physical products where the premiums are much less problematic. Actually, let me jump in on that because it's something else readers have asked about this is a freebie for you. Promote away. Talk your book. Uh, is there a difference between the different Sprott funds? I know that CEF is redeemable. Are all of them redeemable? And why would all somebody choose funds one over the other? are redeemable in large quantities. Okay. If you own seven shares and you want to get a couple of grams, they're not redeemable. I believe that our gold redemption is at the 400 ounce level for gold. So big investors can use it to redeem. And the beauty of the redemption feature is it prevents us from ever selling at large discounts uh, because the arbitrageurs will short the metal, buy the, buy the unit, uh, redeem the, the unit and use the physical to, uh, in fact, cover their shorts. Um, the principal differences, I suspect, between us and the ETFs is that we don't accommodate day-to-day -day shrinks and swells in net asset value, which means that our assets are never counterparty liabilities. Uh, we only have physical precious metals, or very rarely, cash uh, in the trusts. Uh, so you are never at risk of being uh, an unsecured creditor to an insolvent counterparty. Okay. So, the so advantages for, for U.S. holders is that there are often tax advantages associated with owning a trust rather than owning physical precious metals or the ETFs, which are regarded by the IRS as surrogates for physical precious metals. And how you manage not to be regarded as a surrogate is probably a longer conversation we want to have. But basically what you're saying is from somebody looking at your CEF, which is gold and silver, you have a Sprott physical gold, Sprott physical silver and Sprott physical other things. The, the only real difference is just what metal do you want? Is that is That's that right? correct. We have a physical silver trust, a physical gold trust, and then a physical gold and silver trust for people who want us to, to balance the two. We also have a much, much, much smaller platinum and palladium trust. But that really all goes to investor preference. The right. most popular product is the gold and silver trust because I guess what people want one size fits all. All right. Okay. Well, let's move on then to the other yellow metal. Let's talk about uranium. And... I suspect we've got a lot of commonality here as well as we do on gold. So let me focus to maybe an area of difference. I've heard you say, uh, I think repeatedly over recent months, that what we needed to see was more Japanese restarts to push uranium prices higher. And yet here we are, higher uranium prices without really any change in Japan due to the COVID uh, shutdowns. But is it really the COVID shutdowns or have buyers started finally to be forced back to the table? Uh, any any thoughts from your end as to what's going on? And most importantly, is this rally sustainable? With the caveat that uranium markets are notoriously opaque. Uh, and the consequence of that is that the answer I'm going to give you is a speculative answer. Okay. We are just now beginning to see the uptake in long-term contracts that we have anticipated happening for a long time by existing reactors. Uh, a more important impact on the market has been uh, the fact that new built reactors, particularly in China, uh, are forced by their financiers to uh, have fuel supplies sufficient to amortize, say, 65 or 75 percent of the uh, loans, the permanent financing, uh, which has been which has meant that the Chinese uh, new built reactors have been earlier into the long-term supply contracts than has been the case with existing reactors worldwide. We're just beginning to see 
the rebuy cycle uh, in reactors worldwide. That is, that's huge. I mean, they're building what, like 12 right now and they've got plans for Correct. 100 more or something. Correct. Uh, and while I say the market is very, very, very opaque, uh, what we have learned from various cycles is that the important uh, new ad uh, in the contract cycle has been newly built Chinese reactors securing uh, enough supply to amortize the loans <laughs> over time, which is a prudent step for the lender, of course. Sure. You describe the increase in uranium prices from 24 to 30 or some number like that. What it's gone from is uh, absurd to suicidal. <laughs> Uh, and its impact on any junior issuer, uh, I mean, a, a guy that couldn't finance a project into production at 25 can't finance it into production at 30. Uh, it's a blip. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's, no, it, it's, it's, well, one, it's 34, uh, the last okay. broker price index I looked at. Uh, and two, it's, it's a much bigger move than we've seen in the last three years. So, okay, call it a blip, but it's a big one. And it, it has is, specific, you know, uh, causes in the real world out there. It, it is definitely an encouragement, <laughs> and I think it uh, it, it reflects uh, it, it reflects three things. First of all, the utility of you of uranium to users is extraordinary. The stuff is cheap, uh, and there are people coming to understand that. Uh, the second is that any threat of new built production capacity at this price is gone. <laughs> it doesn't work. And then thirdly. Uh, people like uh, Cameco and Kazataprom have two realizations. Uh, first of all, that it makes sense from a market point of view to shut down production, particularly high cost production. But in the case of some of the younger Kazataprom employees, who I've talked to personally, they believe that three years from now or four years from now, they're going to be selling this stuff for 60 bucks a pound. Why would you sell something for $20 a pound when your cost of capital is 6% or 7%, and five years you're gonna, from now you're gonna be selling the stuff for 60 bucks a pound. The concept of resource waste is becoming more apparent to these managers. Okay, than simply that's right. managing let me, let me the jump in on that. I, through let cash me, losses now. Let me push back. Let me push back. Because that, that problem is a, is a quasi at best. You know? So is it a make work program for the Kazaki government? Maybe they, they value jobs more than profits. I would argue that for the Kazataprom managers who are my age, what you say is very true. Uh, they are political animal, animals. When I talk to the Kazataprom employees in their 30s and 40s, they're a different species hmm. in my own experience. Uh, and, and the concept of resource waste and risk adjusted return on capital employed uh, is something that rolls off their tongues much more easily than it does my generation of managers at Kazataprom. Now, Kazataprom is an interesting circumstance. Usually when you balance supply and demand by uh, reducing supply to meet reductions in demand, um, what happens is that you impair for a very long time the industry's ability to increase uh, supply to meet pricing signals. When you balance supply and demand lower by reducing supply, what happens is that when the market firms and the prices go up, that new supply comes on to production to meet the pricing signals. But if you shut down something like Cigar Lake, restarting Cigar Lake isn't something that happens over a quarter, it's something that happens over four or five years. What's unique about Kazataprom is shutting in Inkai, which is a ISL project. And they actually can dial up production very, very quickly. So it'll be interesting to see the, the way that the market responds to the circumstance that we're in today. Uh, I still believe in the very near term that the most important overhang in supply and demand is Japanese inventories. Right now, the uranium trading community and other utilities view that inventory as inventory held for sale rather than as fuel. Uh, if the Japanese reactors begin to restart, then the fact that they have traditionally held five or six or seven years inventory in their fuel cycle uh, means that uh, 40 or so million pounds of inventory on the worldwide market 
uh, gets taken out of the uh, category held for sale uh, and goes into the category called fuel, which is very, very different classification. Sure. I call that a 20-25% shift in supply. So that's quite significant. I get it. Okay. So let's not fight about the blip. Let's say whether blip or not, at some point prices rise above the cost, average cost of production because they have to, and maybe right. even the incentive price because they have to or there won't be any more supply. Right. As that happens, absent another Fukushima or something, do you see that being sustained? Do you see, I mean, it's so famously volatile, one hesitates to believe even that, you know, if it goes up over 60, it could stay there. But, but do you actually see that happen? Is, the uranium industry stabilizing at a price that works? I have no idea. Uh, I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not ducking the question, Lobo. Uh, I, I really have no idea. Um, I am drawn to the arithmetic uh, of uranium's utility to buyers and the discrepancy between supply and demand and the need for the industry to earn its cost of capital. And I'm really drawn to the impact that this would have on the, f on the few remaining <laughs> uranium players that could participate in that. I, I'm not anticipating a rally that is of the same order of magnitude as the rally that I cut my uranium teeth in, which is to say the 2001 to 2006 bull market. But I note that at the beginning of that rally, there were five viable uranium juniors worldwide that survived a 20 year bear market. My suspicion is that there's five or six viable uranium juniors now that have survived this bear market. And my suspicion further is that there are a reasonable number of old fat rich guys like myself that participated in that last market and are dying to, that's the wrong phrase, are <laughs> eager to participate one more time before they shed their mortal coil. And I think if you give those people the opportunity to participate in the sector again, that the uptake that you will see will cause the market caps of those viable juniors uh, to evidence really extraordinary outperformance. You know, in the last cycle, I think I'm gonna get this statistic right, the poorest performing of the five juniors generated a 22 to one return over five years. That's the poorest performer. Now, let's say that this rally was a third as attractive. Let's say that you only got a seven bagger or an eight bagger uh, out of the worst of the performers. Uh, that, from my point of view, is an extremely attractive proposition. Fair enough. Okay. Um, well, we've been going already for 40 minutes here, so I want to try to rip through a couple things real quick before wrapping up. But um, are you still a palladium bull? I mean, there was a very specific set of circumstances, but now we have economic slowdown. Uh, you were right on this. I was wrong. So what do you well, think you now? Were, you, were right on the, you were right on the platinum, <laughs> not the palladium. <laughs> ah, it's good that you remember that. Uh, I am uh, right now not a PGM bull. Uh, I think that the unwinding of the economic cycle that we enjoyed for the last 10 years and the COVID-induced slowdown in industrial demand means that the supply shocks that might occur in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Russia will be less pronounced than they would have been during a bull. You'll remember that for me, platinum and palladium were always both a supply and demand story. And part of my thesis was that any supply shock in one of three countries, South Africa, a basket case, Zimbabwe, not even a country, and Russia, a place that had some challenges, would be pronounced. We got through 10 years without a supply shock. Uh, what happened was simply that demand for palladium uh, outstripped the industry's ability to produce uran uh, palladium at the prices that had been being charged. Simultaneously, the Volkswagen diesel uh, scandal reduced demand for platinum so that palladium, which was a, a, a gasoline catalyst, greatly outstripped platinum, which was, of course, uh, a diesel catalyst. Um, but I'm, uh, as for my own personal holdings in physical platinum and palladium, they're gone. Uh, that money went into the gold market. Okay, good answer. Um, any other industrial metals that might buck the trend? Is there anything that could be in a supply pinch like palladium that even with all this COVID shutdowns and so on, you would consider right now? Uh, oil and gas. 
Uh, that's not a metal, but okay, let's go there. Okay. Uh, uh, oil's I, super I, cheap. I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to say it's going to be quick, because there is systemic uh, oversupply in the system as a consequence of demand destruction. But Greta, notwithstanding, uh, peak oil demand probably occurs in 2045, uh, 2050. The same argument that uh, drives uranium drives oil. I'm not saying to go back into the oil equities, by the way. The oil equities have a credit shock that will follow <laughs> the price shock. And that credit shock is likely to be absolutely breathtaking. But when oil and, ga oil and gas stage their rally, and they will, uh, that'll truly be a rip-your-face-off rally. Uh, and a rip-your-face-off rally in a wonderful business, a big business, uh, a business that in many circumstances is well-run. There will be a point in time in the market that we see where 80% of my resource portfolios will be in conventional oil and gas. We aren't there, uh, but... You know, Lobo, I've lived my life on the fact that the cure for low prices is low prices. And the fact that the oil price went sub-zero <laughs> as a consequence of supply difficulties is my definition of low prices. All right, so that's a, that's a when, not if argument. But for the average person out there, you know, if, if when is a year, okay, maybe it's something I, I, I get. When, but if, if when is a couple years... I mean, <laughs> the supply glut is huge, and if the demand destruction, you know, won't stay as low as it was during total lockdown, but if it's significantly lower than when it's been, then um, can you address the win? No. <laughs> okay. I can't. The truth is, I, I, you know, I, I realize that people have time preferences, and what amuses me is that they think that their preferences matter. Uh, what you want is the total irrelevance. Uh, it's what you can have and what you're prepared to pay for it. Uh, it's odd that at 67 years of age, with less time left on earth, time should be more precious to me. But I've now, as a professional investor, been through nine five-year cycles. <laughs> and the idea that I might have to hold stock over a long weekend is not enigmatic to me. Um, I'm not going to be buying the oil equities because I think the oil is going to go up. I think that we need to go through a credit shock uh, in the oil and gas business before I'm going to be able to buy the stocks. And with any luck at all, I'd say luck from my point of view, with any luck at all, we're going to have a huge blow up in the junk debt market, the Fed notwithstanding, uh, including the oil and gas junk debt. And it may be that I don't buy the oil and gas equities. It may be that I buy uh, oil and gas uh, junk debt at 15 cents on the dollar. Can you imagine being a senior secured creditor or even a secondary creditor where you like the asset values and you bought a seven and a half percent piece of paper, except for that you bought it at 20, uh, which suggests that your running yield is at 25 percent. And if it's a four year bond, your yield to maturity is at 35 or 40 percent. I think there's a real possibility that that exists in the oil and gas market within the next 12 to 18 months. Okay. And if that happens, I'm going to be completely un unconcerned about <laughs> when I'm right. Okay. But for the average retail investor who is not a loan shark, um, mm -hmm. is there a, an oil ETF that you just buy and hold when it's cheap? Or, or is there a safe way to, to play the when, not if question in oil? There isn't a safe way that I know. There may very well be a safe way. Uh, and I wouldn't do it until the headlines that you see uh, involve a wave of defaults on the senior revolving credit facilities, a wave of bankruptcies, particularly in West Texas, and carnage in the junk debt market. Carnage. This is something that you prepare yourself psychologically for. Uh, and you invest in it six months from now, nine months from now, 12 months from now, when your brain tells you, I'm out of my mind doing this, <laughs> when all of the popular press, and frankly, all of the unpopular press, talks about, as The Economist magazine once did, the end of oil. Okay. If your readers are wondering whether this is going to be true, 
they need to ask themselves a simple question, unless they're Tesla owners. <laughs> Five years from now, when they wake up and walk out to their garage and turn the key to the right on their car, will it start? Yes or no? If the answer to that is yes, it means that they believe in 50 or $60 oil, because that's the fully loaded cost of producing oil. Uh, if you move the oil price back to 50 or $60 a barrel, the impact on oil equities relative to what I think they're going to be selling for after a credit crisis in the oil market means that some of these guys are going to be able to give you high quality penny stock moves. Okay, understood. All right, that was a forward looking statement. What are you doing with your own money right now? Is there anything? We've talked generalities, we've talked commodities. Is there some speculation or investment you're making, like deploying cash into right now, that you'd be willing to discuss with the audience? The first thing is I'm deploying my cash into cash. Um, <laughs> I believe that liquidity will give me the tools and the courage to take advantage of volatility rather than being taken advantage of by volatility. I am also, frankly, harvesting some gains where I was able to deploy cash in early March hmm. in what I consider to be excellent speculations uh, and where the bounce back occurred more quickly than I had hoped that it would occur. Uh, I have a list of companies that Sprott believes are reasonable takeover candidates as a consequence of value disparities between them and the companies that are selling with more liquidity. We've noticed We've noticed that uh, two to four or five billion dollar companies have less trading liquidity and trade at lower multiples on a PNAV basis and on an EBIT basis than larger companies. And we've also noticed that multi-asset companies sell at uh, higher multiples than single asset companies. So we think the, nat the natural outcome of that is that smaller, co larger companies will take over smaller companies and multi-asset companies will take over single asset companies. And so while I'm asking most people who are new to the gold space to buy the best of the best names, I've personally had large positions in the best of the best names, and I've had them since 2015. I'm diversifying my own uh, portfolio into names that are less well known. And I'm all also going way, way, way out uh, on the value curve uh, into generative exploration. Uh, back on my own theme with regards to prospect generators, sure, where right. I've been extremely lonely. Uh, and I've always been more comfortable when I've been lonely, Lobo. Um, uh, while I understand that I might not get any gratification for 18 months, I remember at the beginning of the 2000 cycle, the fact that the prospect generators hadn't had to issue stock for the eight years before that cycle, while all of their competitors had been promiscuous issuers. And the con consequence of that is that when money returned into the junior sectors, the prospect generators had an average 400% melt up yes. for no particular reason other that. than the fact that bids came into a no ask market. And I think that history will repeat itself. Uh, so I'm certainly doing that. Would you go farther out to the land banks? Optionality? Or is it? Uh, I actually think that optionality will be a play before the prospect generators will. Hmm. Uh, the reason I say that is that I've performed now uh, portfolio evaluations on 5,500 portfolios that are not Sprott clients yet. Uh, and one of the themes that I have seen among those 5,500 inbound inquiries has been a real fondness for optionality that I thought was gone. Uh, and and I think that optionality, optionality was, was a theme that I had overlooked until I understood how popular it was with a core constituency among juniors. My suspicion is, you know, in the early 90s, when Doug Casey and I were advocates of optionality, optionality was cheap. Nobody cared about it. Uh, now you have some optionality companies. Seabridge is an example. It's sport billion dollar market caps. Optionality is less cheap, but it's much more popular than I had understood as a theme. That's interesting. So when you say I'm doing this or I'm buying this, um, do you ever actually buy shares on the open market or are you just private uh, placements? And You know, increasingly I'm on the open markets. Really? Because increasingly, yeah, uh, increasingly capital markets are generous to companies. 
and the terms that they're willing to give me in the private <laughs> placements doesn't compensate me for the risk I'm taking with regards to the hold. Uh, increasingly, too, uh, the investment banks that are getting the, the uh, tickets for private placements have been aggressive promoters with research uh, of the stock before the private placement. And I found that if I can find a company that's doing good work but is likely to need money in nine months, if I buy it on the open market now, uh, I'm much more likely to be a seller around the time of the private placement than I am a buyer, uh, just as a consequence of the structure of the market. I have noticed this. Uh, but of course, if you do get, I, I think of it as Rick's rule, two years, full warrant as a minimum, or yep. don't call us, we'll call you. There have been financings, like the recent Silvercrest financing, where I wanted to buy a lot of stock. And I had the opportunity to buy a lot of stock. I didn't like the terms of the private placement, but I loved the use of proceeds. <laughs> I loved the deposit, and it was the only way that I could buy $5 million worth of stock for my portfolios without becoming my own worst enemy in the market. So there are circumstances where one must violate every rule. <laughs> Okay, understood. So you mentioned 5,500 portfolios of not yet Sprott clients. So I assume you're talking about your free ranking service where people can sure. send in uh, their list of stocks they have questions about and you will rank them. I find this very interesting and uh, I don't know if I should say this because you do this for free and I have a for pay service where people can request my take on uh, a stock. Now, in my defense, I'll say my take is, is a little bit more detailed than just a ranking. There's a, there's right. a bit of a write-up and there's the pros, the cons, and why I give my take on, on a stock. Um, but I, I guess a question I would have if I was one of my readers and, and thinking about sending my portfolio to you is, what do I do if you disagree with Lobo? I like you both. What happens to me? There is so much information on the web now provided by yourself and myself that a sensible speculator will do some work and come to understand your precept and paradigm and my set precept and paradigm and determine for themselves whether what I do is more comfortable for them or what you do is more comfortable for them. The other thing is, of course, what Buffett said, predictions t tell you a lot about the predictor and very little about the future. So I, I think they need to take your predictions with a grain of salt and my predictions with a grain of salt. Uh, the truth is the fact that uh, speculators care enough about their portfolio that they uh, find out about the availability of these services and implement these services suggest that those speculators will do better than their brothers and sisters in the market. Uh, too many of their competitors uh, operate on the old theorem, got a hunch, better bunch. Uh, from my point of view, I love to talk at length with people who disagree with me smart people who disagree with me, uh, because that's how I learn. Uh, I either get my own beliefs reinforced because I've dealt with the objections, or better yet, somebody knocks me upside the head and I come to the conclusion, uh-oh, <laughs> I was wrong, <laughs> better fix that one. Okay, and I understand that the procedure has changed. It used to be that people would send an email uh, yes. to rankings at sproutglobal.com, but now there's a, there's a web page. You go to a web page. Um, there's, there's a link. Uh, too many people couldn't follow the simple instructions that we gave. <laughs> and to sort of rick proof those instructions, you go to a web page and there's a form, and you enter the names and symbols of the stocks that you have on the form. Uh, hopefully you tell us uh, who told you about us. You know, put Lobo as an example in the subject line, and we will rank those portfolios. I, I am not ten, getting paid to do this. <laughs> Pardon me? I just had to interject that I'm not getting paid to mention this. Yes, yes. No, that's correct. All right. So, and, and the link is, is I understand, sprot2tsprotusa.com forward slash rankings. Correct. correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Well, um, all good. You know, this has been hugely beneficial for us. We have learned so much about people, about how people think, uh, about what causes them to act and invest. Uh, you know, people say, thank you, you've performed this wonderful service. We have received a wonderful service in understanding the way that the market thinks and is influenced and acts. It's been wonderful for us, too. Your optionality comment comes to mind by this. I've been, I've been thinking about it myself. I, I do charge for this, and I do put... Uh, uh, there's a newsletter involved. There's quite a bit of work into these takes, but it has occurred to me that uh, 
I am also getting this feedback. What people are asking for, what does it tell me? What's the appetite for producers versus exploration? Right. What are the most common uh, stocks that people ask about? I'm actually getting useful market intelligence. And honestly, sometimes somebody asks about a company I hadn't looked at. And wow, this is pretty interesting. So right. I have found opportunities thanks to my readers. I'm thinking at, at the future, this could become, this is an evolving product. It's, it's brand new. I just launched it a few months ago. It might become our take at some point in the future if we can figure out a way to systematize, uh, you know, extracting or, or making better use for mutual benefit of that crowdsourced knowledge. One of the things I think is very useful to talk about Lobo for both of our services uh, is that the rankings are snapshots in time. Uh, they're subject to very, very, very frequent change. So the idea that a speculator has that this ranking is some sort of annuity that will last over two or three years <laughs> is wrong. Uh, investors need to stay involved with their holdings. The fact that Rick liked something in May of 2020 will have much less significance in February 2021. Uh, and these suggestions are subject to very, very rapid change, irrespective of yours or mine. Uh, the beauty that somebody gets with regards to your service when they pay for it is that they can update their uh, access to the rankings and you will update the rankings. I update my rankings every week, but unless people become clients, they get the benefit once. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a famous saying that, you know, uh, if, if you don't know what the product is, you're the product. And certainly with regards to Sprott, although the service is no obligation and free, make no mistake, it's a form of advertising and marketing. If the uh, inbound inquiry uh, has conceded that Sprott's or my ranking is a value, they have conceded our value as an organization. And our hope is that after having gone through the uh, process, that they will come to understand the value of some Sprott uh, good or service to them. We believe that this uh, advertising investor, this, this outreach and investor education is the most honest and most effective form of advertising and marketing. But it's certainly a form of advertising and marketing. Well, kudos for being, you know, fessing up and saying that it is a form of advertising. If of somebody uh, gives you their email, do they hear only from you or does that ever get shared? Is there a, a, a spam issue here with... with no, 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 no spam issue. Uh, we certainly try to follow up or more importantly, ask them to follow up with us. You know, I say in my response, I'd love to compete for your business, which Lobo, as you know, is true. Uh, it's up to the recipient uh, as to whether or not they choose to do business with us. There is no obligation. Sure. Understood. All right. Well, we've gone on for an hour here. I appreciate your very generous sharing of time with us. Anything else on your mind that you want to make sure uh, we uh, get to out to the audience? Well, in addition to the rankings, uh, I, I will distribute to anybody who makes inquiry uh, a 45-year-long chart of the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the broadest and most inclusive of the gold equities indexes. Useful not from the point of view of technical analysis, but rather as a visual tool to see where we are relative to prior markets and the response of prior markets and the periodicity of both bull markets and bear markets. And a hundred year ch commodity chart, uh, which will tell you an awful lot about what I think will happen three years from now or four years from now in industrial commodities. Hint, relative to other asset classes, they're the cheapest they've been in a hundred years. Well, that's, so, a, that's an enticing offer. I guess while I'm, while I'm giving you a freebie here, I should also um, mention the Sprott Conference. I understand that that's been moved uh, off, the, out of real space and online and due to the COVID shutdowns and so on. Uh, but, but there will be a conference. There will be a virtual conference. And I'll speak at it, right? Uh, you will definitely speak at it. There will be a virtual conference. It seems that certain people thought that having a thousand of our closest friends in close confines, talking and eating and drinking wasn't a good idea with a pandemic at, at, at loose. Uh, and so we've decided to do this as a virtual conference. Details to follow. Okay. The beauty of a virtual conflict, uh, conference, frankly, is that if you can't attend the Lobo Tigre workshop at the same time that the Doug Casey workshop takes place, uh, you can uh, look at one or the other non-live. Uh, and I think that's a real advantage. It means that the uh, amount of speakers that we can have, the amount of input that we can have, uh, is limited only by the number of speakers who interest us. Uh, 
And that's a really, <laughs> really enticing idea. Because every year, the physical time I have available to me is my key limitation. Uh, every year, there are 20 speakers who I would love to have had, but I would have had to force out a speaker that I maybe like a little more. Uh, and I no longer have to impose that sort of discipline on myself. I can become a really promiscuous consumer of information, which is what I, what I prefer to be. All right, very good. All right, so to be continued. Correct. And we should do this more often. This is fun. We should. Very good. All right. Well, thank you for this hour and you take care and be well. Always a pleasure, sir.